The question here today is just uh, is childhood self control a foundation for later success? Uh, and I'm really just going to present some of the headline findings that we've been kind of uh, taking out of the cohort studies in the last uh, year or two. So, um, what is self control? I guess is is one of the key questions. And there's lots of different definitions, and and kind of you know the construct kind of varies across different areas of psychology. And uh, if you're looking at economics as well, uh, one of the kind of de definitions around you know conscientiousness has different facets, uh, and you know there's things like industriousness and orderliness and responsibility and so on. But one of them is self-discipline, and that's really the capacity to finish a task, to begin it, finish it through to completion in the presence of boredom and distraction. And that's one of the kind of the, 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 the kind of constructs that we're tapping into with the measures that we're looking at. And also on a more um, broader level, if you think of the umbrella construct of self-control, it's this capacity to voluntarily regulate your thoughts, feelings, and behavior in order to you know, achieve a long-term goal. And usually it's about resolving conflict between immediate uh, desires and distractions and your kind of more valued uh, long-term perspective. And yeah, if you look at it across developmental psychology, you hear terms like effortful control, neuropsychology, you'll hear inhibitory control and executive function and personality psychology, self-regulation and, and so on. So it's really, it's quite a broad construct um, and th this is what we're looking at. Uh, so there is a literature on conscientiousness, which as I mentioned is again broader in the terms of capturing these other things like being a perfectionist or being very kind of dil diligent and industrious. Uh, so it captures other facets as well. And there are a set of studies showing the relationship between conscientiousness and education and occupational success. So Brent Roberts has a study uh, several years ago kind of uh, overviewing those in uh, perspectives in psychological science. And then what we have is an emerging literature specifically focused on self-control and childhood self-control and predicting later outcomes. So this is the most kind of well-cited study is a study by Terry Moffat and colleagues using the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Cohort Study, and that's 2011, I think late 2011, and it's already cited 800 times. So uh, it's getting a lot of traction. And um, the kind of questions that they ask in that study, things like you know lacking persistence, short attention span, distractibility, poor impulse control, and they used a composite of teacher, parent, uh, observer rating and also uh, some child rated uh, perspectives on their own behavior together to produce a composite measure of self-control which they show to predict lots of indicators of adult success like you know doing well in your job in terms of social class social mobility income having less financial struggles uh, and so on so you can see that there on their on their kind of quintiles of self-control related to the outcome so the kind of the, the, the goal of the studies that I'm going to present or the study is to replicate these findings from Moffat in the British cohorts. So we have a larger sample, more extensive potential control variables, and also where possible to look beyond uh, the time perspective that's looked at in that study. They, they only were around 30, whereas in the cohort studies you can now go up to age 55 in the National Child Development Study. So it's, it's a more extensive time horizon, which is important if you're interested in some of these variables, like uh, if a person goes on to be a leader, or um, you know, even, even aspects around their, their social mobility. It's, it's kind of early, early days for a lot of people. A lot of people are, especially if they're doing a PhD or something, they're barely out of 32 is like, you know, yeah, in, still in education. So, uh, so yeah, we want to do this and examining the association then between some of the unexamined outcomes. So things like uh, pensions haven't really been looked at yet or leadership. So we wanted to look at those or unemployment. So the two studies then, anyone that knows the cohort studies will know this kind of set up quite well. Um, study one, the British cohort study started in 1970, uh, over 17,000 births and uh, all in the same in March and then they're followed up then at age 10, 21, 26, and every four years until age 42. And then the National Child Development Study, again, similar sample size from 1958, again, March, and then followed up, you know, age 7, 11, 16, and then 23, the whole way up to actually age 55 is the new data set that's out at the moment um, from 2013. Um, yeah, so there are the two studies. And then the self-control measures then, uh, obviously, you know, basically, there are kind of gold standard ways to measure self-control at the moment. You can use things like whether you want to use inhibitory control behavioral tasks or you want to use 
kind of extensively validated measures of self-control, that's great. Um, this is 1965, so you know we have to use what we have. Uh, and some of the measures are actually pretty good. Like in the British cohort study, we have tap it, it, this measure again. If you think of the idea of you know completing a task despite distraction, you have perseverance, you have distraction, you're paying attention in class, completing tasks, and so on. So you have these aspects of attention and regulation and, and perseverance captured within that measure. The measure in the NCDS is actually there's another several items on, on here that I didn't fit in, but there's 13 items. And again, some of them are capturing attention, perseverance, uh, impulse control, um, and then other ones uh, like there's one that's I didn't put up there, whether the teacher thinks the student is slapdash, which is you know not really a phrase that's used anymore. Uh, and then there's like, you know, follower in mischief, which is kind of, you know, again, one of the ones where you're kind of kind of going, yeah, the, I, I, we, we can't actually for the BCS, we have all the items. For NCDS, we just have composite scores. And uh, I've talked to the CLS, CLS, and they're in a box, basically, in the basement, the item scores for these. So maybe someday we'll get them, they'll get them coded up. But we have the total score, so we can't take out slapdash at the moment. <laughs> so that, that's, uh, that's where we're at. So this is what it looks like. So the, again, the BCS measures are better because it's a visual analog scale. And um, you know, code it to one, between 1 and 40. Seven, so you can kind of for each question you can get a lot of heterogeneity. Whereas for the, you know, this, these are just binary. So the kids on the right are the self-control kids, and the kids on the left are the less self-control. So what you see is in both cases, you know, negative skew. But in the case of NCDS, you know, we've less heterogeneity to work with, and that kind of affects our, you know, some of the you get more noise in the in the estimates really. But um, yeah, so so they're they're the two and. For, for both of them, we have, like, especially in the NCDS, we have nearly all of the sample on the measures, 16,000, whereas in, you know, we have 11 and a half at baseline in the BCS. So just to get straight on, uh, one of the first things we looked at was unemployment. We were interested in this because we've done other work on unemployment, the well-being scarring effects of unemployment and so on. Um, and there's really good data. There's data on, on a kind of a monthly level in uh, the whole way through life in both of these cohorts. So what, what that allowed us to do was produce, you know, individual wave levels and also cumulative levels and uh, we even have a part of the paper looking at the 1980 recession in the UK where you can pick out exactly the trends in unemployment month by month and how they differ by self-control um, which is kind of we're kind of generalizing to the current recession saying you know people with low self-control are actually more disproportionately affected by recessions so um, what you can see here is a uh, probe marginal effects and Again, I probably should have put up here maybe the unemployment rate because it's quite relevant. Uh, 1970 guys, you're think, you're, these are the cohort that graduated into you know one of the best labour markets that we've had in the last you know several decades. So, uh, and a lot of this is through say late 90s, early 2000s. So the unemployment rate is very low. But what you still see is large uh, associations between childhood self-control. Uh, so 4% less at age 21, 1.5%, 1.4% at age 30. And in some cases, you know, even if you go as far as um, age 42, the unemployment rate in this group was maybe 2%, which yet you got, you know, a standard deviation increase in self-control was almost linked to a percentage less unemployment. So they're quite um, large effects. They control for, you know, in this, in this regression, it's just uh, intelligence and gender and parental SES. But, you know, what we do in the paper is we have a lot of different robustness tests. We control for conduct problems. We, um, you know, we eliminate some of the people on the kind of extreme of the distribution. We have over, I think, 60 different control variables for family background, uh, geographical location, family uh, crowding, family difficulties, um, a whole set of childhood health conditions, and you know, any, anything that we could possibly think would affect the association from the cohort studies, which is a lot of comprehensive data. So that's kind of what the trends look like when you put them together. And um, so over their lifetime in this sample, you get about six and a half months of unemployment in the low self-control group, that's minus one standard deviation. And in the high self-control group, you get about four months. So maybe 50%, 60% more uh, unemployment in terms of duration. And then you can see that the role of self-control in, in, in predicting unemployment kind of kind of diminishes a little bit over time. So you, you see it mostly at age 21, 26, 30. But, you know, again, that has to be considered within the context of a declining unemployment rate in this sample uh, who were in a, emerged into a really prosperous labor market. 
Uh, in the NCDS then, you see a similar kind of a pattern of results and you can kind of benchmark them against intelligence. I'm, some people, you know, we presented this to uh, Ian Deary's Cognitive Epidemiology Group in Edinburgh and they were kind of really sceptical, but, you know, because they, they think intelligence is the most important thing for everything. But, uh, you know, these are, it's actually larger effects here in, in many of the cases. So, uh, like, um, it's, it's, we were somewhat surprised. But, uh, yeah, so you see, like, even in terms of these are negative binomial coefficients for the total duration of unemployment, and you can see that they're, you know, one standard deviation, you see pretty, pretty similar uh, associations between self-control and intelligence across life predicting uh, unemployment. So, uh, and again, you get maybe a little bit, uh, well, actually pretty much the same, 15, 60% more unemployment if you go down to the one standard deviation lower than the mean versus one standard deviation higher. So, yeah, so self-control, important for unemployment basically and uh, we have kind of a really comprehensive discussion around the theory and so on in the in the paper it's in psych science if you want to check it out but uh, yeah so so this is more um, less less well developed we've just finished this um, paper on socioeconomic status and uh, it's using the British cohort study the main author is Fanula O'Reilly who uh, did our masters in behavioral sciences and is now in the behavioral insights team in London and uh, really what this aim to do again was to try and see, you know, if you look at self-control, you look, compare it to cognitive ability, what's the predictive value in terms of the association with all of the things that we might think of as important in terms of socioeconomic status. So, you know, when, did, how long did you stay in education? Uh, what was your highest education qualification in terms of national vocation qualifications in the UK? Uh, what was your household income, your social class, and whether you owned a house? And we controlled for a little bit more in terms of social class at birth, mother's education, parental home ownership, home ownership and then you know the, the same kind of things around conduct problems and mental health. So the main predictors, I suppose, of later uh, kind of individual difference characteristics and parental demographics that you might think of as predictive of later SES. And what you see is that a you know it's a standard deviation increase in self control, pretty pretty larger effects on self rated financial position, but. You know, again, that's maybe not our most important outcome. That's say, saying if you think you're, you know, you agree that you have a, or you strongly agree that your financial position is strong. And uh, then their age finished education. Again, you about maybe two thirds of the association compared to, say, um, compared to intelligence. And then social class and property ownership actually seem to be more predictive self control. We don't really understand why uh, that's at age 30. Uh, at age 42, Again, similar type of pattern of results. Uh, you wouldn't expect the education ones to change anyway because most people are finished education, except for the PhD students by age 30 or whatever. So, but at age 42, you, sim you see similar patterns of results. So one thing we could do, I guess that's an extension beyond the original Moffat paper. And the other thing that we could do is control for the socioeconomic status at, at age 30. So we're looking at social mobility here within the person over time. Um, and what you see when you look at that is that yeah, like you see, again, quite similar associations, maybe three quarters of the strength of uh, cognitive ability in terms of the association between self-control and social class, income, self-rated finan financial position and, and property ownership um, between the ages of 30 and 42. So this is kind of social mobility. So uh, I guess what, what we can say from, from this study then is, yeah, there, there's, sorry, I won't go to that yet. But uh, yeah, that, 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 it, that it seems to extend the findings of the previous study and you know, we have this across several thousand people and it's in the UK. So it's, it's nice to you know, do this in a different sample. So uh, the, other, the other kind of final thing that I wanted to talk about in this uh, overview is the outcomes that we examined that haven't been examined before. So pensions is one and you know, we all know there's a huge problem with people not saving enough or not even having a pension. So we've just kind of started this now and what we're looking at is the relationship between, again, uh, self-controlled cognitive ability and a range of other factors, and whether the person has a pension is our starting point. And then we're kind of going to break that down into, you know, private and uh, workplace versus uh, private pensions, trying to get data at the moment on the extent of their pension savings. So we might be able to estimate whether they're saving adequately for their retirement. But at the moment, the initial thing what, that we have is just the probability of having a pension. So. Um, these are uh, again uh, margins graphs for um, based on total margin effects of 
child self control and probability of having a pension. So you can see, like it starts, you know, we're starting pretty high here, seventy two percent. So uh, in this sample, anyway, you're talking about five percent percentage point difference between low and high self, or ten percentage point difference between low and high self control in terms of whether you actually have a pension, which is, you know, obviously important. And then when we look at it in the NCDS, you basically see the exact same result. So uh, again, reassuring just to see that it's it's robust across uh, both of them. Um, yeah, and like most of the, I guess if you're, you can, we can break it down, but uh, it's early stage, so we need to kind of develop it a bit more in terms of, like I said, looking at the different types of pensions and the amount of savings. But this is an initial indication that it seems to be important like the different kind of pathways that we looked at, I guess if you think about self-control, it could influence uh, your likelihood of having a pension in many different ways. It could be that you're more able to save because you can you know, ignore all those tempting distractions, uh, save over the course of a month and actually put that in the bank. It could be that you have kind of a preference for commitment, so you want to actually you know, save because you say, well, I, or you want to bind yourself to the mass to say, yeah, I put my, I'll, put, I'll put myself into this pension plan and then it'll kind of help even you know, enable my self-control. Or it could be just your life turns out a lot better because you have better self-control. We already know it predicts social, uh, social mobility, unemployment, and um, to give away the next slide, leadership. So if you consider all of those in the model, what you see is that this effect diminishes by about um, 60%. So about you know nearly two-thirds, I imagine, we'd be able to explain by your pathways through life, which I think is interesting just because you know if you put, say, adult self-control into a model, and you predict whether you have a pension, and you will have to put in your demographic controls, which are, of course, education, income, unemployment, and so on, you'll actually underestimate the potential role of self-control by quite a lot, because these are actually pathways to which you know, your outcome occurs. So in that sense, uh, it's nice to be able to look at childhood um, self-control. And the other kind of reason, I suppose, is that reverse causality is a factor. We have a paper in the Journal of Applied Psychology where we show that conscientiousness is actually affected by unemployment, uh, as you potentially might expect. People become you know, less, a little less reliable and diligent as they, um, their time unemployed goes on into the future. And the other one is that, you know, like in preparing for life, we want to know if there are effects on self-control of early intervention programs and their magnitude is, say, you know, half a standard deviation. What are the potential implications for people over their life in terms of what their outcomes might look like because of this uh, whatever uh, intervention effect? So in that case, it's worth um, exploring some of these outcomes. So the final one we've looked at, just because um, I'm in a management school and they care about leadership, so I have to write something that looks like I should be there, is a uh, leadership role occupancy, which is uh, something I wasn't wasn't that interested in until recently, but uh, the. There seems to be an association between, <coughs> for this one I'm intelligent, it's a little bit more, you know, mixed. They're in the bridge course study, it's pretty solid relationship, a standard deviation, you're 5% more likely to be a leader. And um, for intelligence, it's a lot stronger. And that we published that in Leadership Quarterly. Uh, and, you know, it's one of those ones that was not in the literature, but shockingly, intelligent kids go on to be leaders. Uh, so, so um, that, that, but also self-control kids. In the NCDS, we don't see the same strength of relationship, and we don't really know what that, that is the case. It's only about one and a half or two percent uh, increased likelihood of being a leader. And you know, a leader is just somebody that supervises employees, and it's contrasted with other employees. And we have then kind of a scale of supervision that we look at whether you're supervising more than 25 employees and so on. But generally, it seems to be that self, yes, self control predicts leadership more so in the BCS than NCDS, and we don't know whether that's something to do with the uh, measures that we're using or a change over time. It's maybe a combination of both. And then we have, you know, there's lots of different bits and pieces to these papers. One is that, rather disappointingly, if you look at um, the gender effect, we all know about the glass ceiling, but there's also an intelligence and a self-control ceiling of sorts where the strength of the association between these two factors and leadership is actually lower for women than men. So, you know, all other things considered, um, there's less of, uh, they're, they're rewarded less by the workplace and it's, you know, separate to the uh, main effect of, of gender. So, yeah, that, those are kind of the, the main findings. So, just to kind of wrap up, we know the childhood self-control is associated with adult success in these two cohorts. Um, the strength, if you average across all of these outcomes, intelligence and CSES at birth, 
and childhood self-control, these three factors are pretty comparable in terms of their importance. And that's what the original Moffat paper found. Uh, we can extend out from age 30 to age 50 or 55. And the kind of things we're doing now, we're looking at things like um, we have a mental health paper that has a sibling fixed effect to control for differences between uh, parents um, or, you know, to between between different families and then we have also difference and difference approaches to look at recession interactions but we'd like to you know that's basically do kids with different levels of self-control do worse or better uh, after a huge macroeconomic change and then we want to look at policy interactions as well so there's a big kind of research agenda over the next few years but uh yeah i'll, I'll leave it there thanks very much for your attention